Hey, how you doing? And welcome back to another episode of The Rules of Investing, a podcast that gets inside the minds of leading investors, economists and industry experts, brought to you by Livewire Markets. I'm Ali Selby, and in the last episode, you heard from Resolution Capital's Andrew Parsons, who dissected Australia's big property problem and argued that the Aussie government has its head in the sand on housing. This week, we're focusing on a topic that has taken the market by storm. It's the Great Rotation. In the last month, the US volatility index has lifted around 36%, with investors pulling their cash out of tech giants in favour of small caps and undervalued stocks. We're yet to see anything like it down under. And while the Aussie market sure is concentrated like our US counterpart, the majority of our large cap companies are banks and miners, not all powerful trillion dollar tech stocks. So can we expect a great rotation on the ASX? To answer that question, we're joined by Arden Jennings, the co-head of Emerging Companies and the portfolio manager of small and micro caps at Osbeal Investment Management. Despite his youthful looks, he's been managing investors' money for more than 12 years now, and recently he's been doing a bloody good job at it. His fund has delivered a return of 24.25% per annum since its inception in April 2020, beating the index by a whopping 16.24%. And in case you've forgotten, it's been a pretty tough few years for small caps. In this podcast, we'll discuss the opportunities that Arden is seeing in small and micro cap land today, what investors can expect this reporting season, and the wildcard events that could impact investors' portfolios over the next few months. If you're an Apple podcast or Spotify user, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode. Or if you're a Livewire subscriber, hit the follow button at the bottom of the wire to be notified when new episodes are available. Not a Livewire subscriber yet? Just head on over to livewiremarkets.com. It's free, easy to register, and you'll get access to the insights from leading investment minds in the country. Okay, with all that done, let's get on with the show. Thank you so much for joining us on the Rules of Investing today, Arden. Haven't talked to you in what feels like years. I'm really excited to catch up and learn about what you're what you're seeing in markets today. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Appreciate you having me here, and uh, yeah, really looking forward to it. Aussie small and micro caps have staged somewhat of a recovery over the last nine months. The small odds has rebounded around 17%, pretty good. Your fund beat the index, delivering investors a return of nearly 26% in FY24. What are some of the decisions that you think you made that really boosted that outperformance? Yeah, you're right, Ali. Uh, Small caps, they're back, uh, which is great news after a a tough couple of years. Um, But, you know, from a big picture perspective, I suppose, you know, from Ausbill's perspective, Last year, you know, it was our view that we were coming in um, uh, with a peaking of rates. Um, so, um, in, in terms of interest rate rises, and that was going to be, um, you know, positive for equity markets um, with with inflation being controlled. So, you know, that meant that we weren't being uh, really defensively positioned. Um, so, we were taking advantage of the opportunity in the smaller micro cap space to to find the best opportunities. Now. The macro is really only about 10% of the input into our process, but 90% is, you know, bottom up fundamental stock picking. So I guess, you know, for the last year in FY24, you know, it certainly wasn't an overnight success. You know, um, a lot of the companies um, that were winners, you know, Life360, LaVisa, ProMedicus, um, Tuas, they're all in the portfolio for a number of years. And, you know, if I think back, you know, prior to the financial year, you know, Life 360, we actually met the company in 2019 when they were trying to IPO. Mm. Uh, we actually passed on that because they didn't meet our investment grade filter. They weren't profitable yet. So but we stayed in touch with the company and we actually invested in 2021. But it wasn't until 2020, you know, FY24 that, you know, it really made those really strong returns. Um, you know, ProMedicus, another example, invested in, uh, saw them in 20, 2022 in the US, met the head of sales. Stock was around $40. That's when we entered the position. We'll finish the financial year at, F, uh, at over $140. So, you know, really good return. So, it, yeah, it certainly wasn't an overnight success. A lot of the positions that started in the portfolio, spread of individual names, spread of sectors. You know, LaVis is a retailer, Tuas is Telco, i 360s is technology, ProMedic is healthcare, of course. So, there's a real spread of sectors. But I think the last thing I'd say is, you know, quarterizing your losses is really important. You've always got to be looking forward. 
And I'm not sure if you um, heard, Ali, that Roger Federer recently did a speech at a university that went viral. And he spoke about his career as a, a tennis player, um, mentioning that he won almost 80% of his matches, um, which is you know a huge achievement in itself. But um, I'm not sure if you could guess how many points that he actually won across the point of his career. It was only 54%. Wow. So um, although he won 80% of matches, only 54% of points and... I had a look at our performance and actually we had a similar mix of winners and losers. But I think the point is there that, you know, um, you know, it's the points that you win that matter. You've always got to be looking forward. So you've got to cut the losers and you can't fall in love with stocks. Um, stocks is just points, um, but it's the points that matter that win you the game. So for us, you know, our largest detractor was still smaller than our 17 biggest winners. So even though we had an even spread of, you know, winners and losers, it's the ones that... Uh, were successful that made it a good year. So are you the Roger Federer of Australian small caps then? I'm a fan of Roger, Sp- Roger Federer, but I uh, wouldn't put myself in his category. No. You talked before about making that interest rate bat- bet 12 months ago. Markets are now, I guess, a little bit worried about a rake, rate hike in August. How are you feeling about that? Yeah, so here domestically, there's roughly a 20% chance, according to Bloomberg, of, you know, a rate hike coming year. Um, that's not our view at Ausbill. Um, you know, we, we think rates are on hold. We're obviously going to get a CPI print this week. Um, but over in the US, um, you know, chances are that we'll get a rate cut in September. We've already seen Bank of Canada um, cut, um, European Central Bank uh, cut, and also the Swiss National Bank, they've cut twice now. So interest rates globally are coming down, which is going to be conducive for, for markets. We talked before about this rebound that we've seen in smaller micro caps over the last few months. Do you think that can continue? Uh, I definitely think, uh, yes, it can. Obviously, we're seeing that in the US right now. We're getting cuts over in the US um, or, or factored in to the market as expectations from an interest rate perspective. Uh, we, it's not our view that we're going to be getting interest rate cuts um, in the very near term. Um, but there may be scope down the track, potentially, if it's not later this year, potentially next year. Um, uh, but we'll see how the data comes in. But, uh, but could that great rotation bleed through to Aussie stocks even without those cuts? We think it will, and that will continue. We've already started to see that. Um, small cap industrials have underperformed large caps by about 35%. If you look at it on a rolling three-year basis on performance, so they've really underperformed. But it's only, they bounce around 5%, but... You know, there's still a significant way to go in terms of catching up to uh, some of those large caps. So, yeah, we think it continue, can continue. Okay. And what kind of stocks do you think could benefit? In the US, it's really been, I guess, those outer love stocks. What will it be here? Yeah, we do think some of the cyclicals, um, particularly exposed to those interest rate cuts offshore, should um, benefit. Um, so, you know, um, companies here, whether it be in the financial sector you know, Hub24 is going to be obviously leveraged to markets. Credit Corp and Zip are two names that are, you know, have, you know, US exposure and they'll benefit from lower rates and more accommodative uh, funding. So, you know, they're the types of stocks and sectors that we think will benefit um, from some cuts in the US. Other than financials, is there anything else that you would want to name out? Um, I think uh, the REIT sector in the US will benefit. Um, How about here in Australia? We're not, we're not there because we don't think, um, well, not really part of our process, um, but we think the, the Aussie stocks, like I mentioned, in the financials should um, should benefit. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're probably the area. Tech stocks will still benefit. We think they're relatively undervalued, particularly some of these small micro cap names. Um, you know, 360 is a big position for us. We've also got positions outside of our top 10, like Doug Technologies, that we think um, you know, is still relatively undervalued um, and will benefit uh, benefit from that. Arden, are there any wild cards that you think could impact your thinking? Yeah, I think if we look forward, you know, geopolitical is always a wild card. Um, it's very difficult to price in and, and mitigate from a risk perspective. Mm. Um, it's changing so quickly at the moment. Every week there's a new story. Exactly. So you obviously got the Trump... Um, uh, Harris election in the US coming up um, so that could create some volatility we don't know exactly what Trump's going to bring he can be quite um, erratic at times um, at least we you know from experience in in, in the first his first terms um, 
assuming that he is elected. Um, so that could be, you know, throw some real wild cards out there. Is that what you're thinking, that he will be re-elected? Uh, we, I don't think we have a house view on, you know, who's going to win. We don't think it's going to change markets um, too dramatically either way, but it will create volatility. So that should create opportunities in Australian small caps and micro caps. Are there any other wild cards that you're worried about that could impact the portfolio companies that you're holding right now? Uh, I wish I knew. Um, but uh, no, I mean, look, inflation obviously is, um, if it is more sticky here in Australia and we, and, um, you know, we do see interest rates rise here, that wouldn't be a good outcome um, for equities. Um, but we think it'd be short-lived even if it was the case, if there was a rate rise. Uh, it's not our view, but if it, if it was, then that wouldn't um, be great short term. But we think it actually could potentially pull forward a rate cut down the track anyway. Okay. You mentioned before you don't really feel like Trump or Harris winning will impact markets at all. So your portfolio, you'd keep it the same no matter what happens. And it's the same for inflation as well. Yeah, on the first scenario, we, I don't think we'd actually change anything. Um, obviously, we'd have to see what comes out. But, um, you know, I think it'd just be a buying opportunity if you had a bit of volatility, um, you know, in some of our smaller micro cap names here. You know, in reality, um, does it matter whether it's Trump or Harris that wins um, for Life360 or Aussie Broadband here selling MBN services in Australia, mm. um, you know, or to us with, you know, in, in Singapore selling mobile, you know, plans and, and broadband. I don't think so. So, um, you know, from that perspective, we just see it as a buying opportunity. Okay. We're fast running up to reporting season here in Australia. What's one thing you think investors need to get right to be successful over the next month? Yeah, for us, it's all about earnings. Um, so our belief of earnings and earnings revisions are the key driver of stock prices. So simply, we need to pick stocks that are in upgrade cycles and avoid those that are they're going to downgrade earnings. So I think that's always um, key coming up to reporting season. That's easier said than done, though. It is, yeah. So it certainly is, but you've got to do the work. Um, so, you know, um, that's obviously a focus coming into reporting season. Generally, it's pretty good um, for us, given we're in earnings focused house, touch wood, um, for this reporting season. Uh, but today, it, um, yeah, generally it's a pretty good time um, for stock picking. Are there any stocks that you think investors should be wary of this August reporting season? Oh, I think um, every reporting season crowded trades are always tricky to navigate and we own a few of them. Mm. Um, you said I'd Life360 like before, I'd, yeah. And I'd like to think that we were there um, a lot earlier, you know, Life360 2021, um, similarly with two us and a few others that um, we've actually been there a very long time. Um, but you've got to be really careful with the crowded trades because even if they do upgrade company, these companies, um, sometimes it doesn't meet the expectations of the market and you can see the stocks go down. So uh, yeah, expectations uh, and what's in the price is always important. So um, I think crowded trades, you've got to be really careful. If they miss, um, you know, stocks will get hammered pretty hard. So that'll create... Um, potentially opportunities if, if the thesis isn't broken, uh, but certainly creates volatility for that small caps. Are there any stocks on your watch list that you're very excited about? Um, yeah, coming up to reporting season, you know, um, I'd like to think that, you know, our top 10, given that's around half of our portfolio, um, is representative of, you know, our best ideas going into reporting season. Um, you know, one that has disappointed more recently is Aussie Broadband, NBN um, uh, reseller, but increasingly becoming focused on um, business and enterprise. Um, and we believe that um, as one analyst um, penned his note saying the lows are in. So looking forward to seeing uh, the results, you know, um, should be a strong cash flow results. Hopefully um, balance sheet will be in good shape. So yeah, we're looking forward to that one post a challenging couple of months, um, but that's one we've been increasing our position uh, more recently. Okay, we've come to the end of the episode where we ask you three final questions. It's meant to be fun. I hope you have fun answering these. It's meant to be a thought experiment. Okay, first question. What is one thing that you think investors are currently getting wrong about markets? Well, maybe they're not getting it wrong, but I think um, the opportunity for active managers that's created by passive investing. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, S&P and the indexes, they have generally quarterly rebalancing. And for us, it's like Christmas. Um, all the promotions, they get bought up as they enter the indexes and hopefully you're on the right side. But if you're on the naughty list um, and you're, you're being deleted from an index, um, it's indiscriminate selling that can 
can hit those stocks really hard. So I think that creates um, you know fantastic opportunities for for active managers um, as passive money um, you know is increasingly becoming a, a significant impact in the market. And you know we've seen it more recently with CBA, one of the most expensive banks in the world, but it's also one of the most, most highest quality. And with everyone putting you know 11.5% going to 12% next year into their superannuation guarantee. You know, there is significant money coming into the space from a passive perspective. So it's exciting for active managers. Can you take us through an example of how you've exploited that opportunity, perhaps with a stock that's fallen out of an index? Yeah, so um, um, we'd like to think that, you know, we're, we're on the right side uh, more often than not, which we generally are. So we actually find um, that we're trimming some of those positions into those index events. Um, perhaps they were large positions, we got it right, so the index is buying them. Um, I remember Genesis Minerals, um, GMD is the ticker that um, recently went into the ASX 200, huge volume on the close. So we have used that as opportunities to, to trim into. Um, when things do get deleted though, they're generally bombed out and they take some time, you know, after being in the sin bin for, for, for some time to, um, to recover. So, and sometimes a lot of them don't, unfortunately. So right. not many examples. Um, You're not touching them. No. Okay. Sure. What's the story of a big win or a big loss from your career so far? And what did you learn from that? I don't invest um, personally. I put my money in the fund. Um, so, you know, just to avoid any conflicts and make sure I'm aligned with investors. But um, maybe a personal one, you know, it was around 20 years ago that I invested in a little micro cap called Fortescue Metals. Um, and at the time um, I invested, put around, uh, bought around a thousand shares, was $4.50. Stock ran to over $130. They've done a 10 for one split since. So, you know, that's equivalent of 40 cents, buying it around 45 cents, it ran to $13. Um, but I didn't um, take any profits. So the lesson was to always trim your winners. So I should have taken profits. Um, you know, along the way. So that um, was really obviously a really good lesson. Um, you know, that was 20 years ago, I was still at school and I had, you know, and, over $130,000 in Fortescue after a very small investment. So, um, you know, a really good lesson from many years ago. When did you start investing? Uh, when I was very young, actually. Um, yeah, my, um, my dad had an iris and he was previously in foreign exchange. And so an iris trading platform. So I was playing on that from the age of 10 or 12, uh, Wow. 10, 11, 12, you know, back in the day when they had T1, T2, which is Telstra shares. Um, so I started investing uh, from a very young age. And uh, yeah, that's really what lit my passion and fire for investing, you know, jagging something like Fortescue, um, you know, that did really well, learned a lot of lessons along the way. Um, so yeah, it's definitely live and breathe markets. I love that. Okay. Last question for our market animal then today. If the market was to close for five years, which one stock would you want to own and why? It can either be a defensive stock, which some people seem to choose, or it can be like the stock that you think will just absolutely shoot the lights out. You can only hold one stock. Okay, so my thought process was I'd like to pick a founder-led business. Um, you know, we like founder-led businesses, generally outperform. You know, if, if you've got founders who have significant shareholdings, they've got skin in the game you know, with an alignment of interest. They typically take a long-term mindset so even if it's at the expense of short-term profits, they'll make decisions based on the long term. And they have, you know, relatively steady or evolving cultures. And it's hard to put a dollar value on company's culture, but we certainly know it does add shareholder value. So I'd pick a founder-led business, you know, perhaps something that has more recurring revenue in the telco space, you know, like an Aussie broadband or a, a Tuas. They're both, you know, um, founder-led businesses. But if I had to back one, um, it would be Tuas, which is backed by David Teo, mm. uh, the founder of TPG Telecom here, as we know today. But they're replicating the strategy in Singapore. Um, you know, started from scratch in the mobile space. They've quickly grown to around 10% market share um, through a price leadership approach. And it's exactly the same playbook as what we saw here in Australia, where they took over 20% market share in, in sort of around 10 years from starting up. So, you know, I think um, backing a founder-led business um, breaking into a new market and growing, I think, uh, yeah, I'd back uh, David Teo, it's the chairman of Tuas, TUA. Is that your highest conviction position today or is it uh, Life360? Life360 is the largest position in our fund, but uh, TUA is not too far from that. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Arden. It was awesome to learn about how you're thinking about markets and 
learn about some of your favourite stocks. Thank you for coming on the Rules of Investing. Thanks, Ali.